Good afternoon. Welcome to Spy Chat. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us today. Our Executive Director, Chris Costa, is joined by Dr. Fiona Hill, who is a Senior Fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institute. Fiona has an illustrious career. I'm just going to highlight a little bit of it, which includes during two leaves from Brookings, she served as deputy assistant to the president and senior director for European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council from 2017 to 2019. And from 2006 to 2009, she served as nat national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. Fiona has researched and published extensively on issues related to Russia, the Caucasus, Central Asia, regional conflicts, energy and strategic issues, pretty much everything we're worried about right now. She is the co-author of Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, and her most recent book, there is nothing for you here. Finding opportunity in the 21st century is a memoir which includes her experiences serving in the Trump administration and her recommendations for the future drawn from her life and work. After Chris and Fiona speak about the issues that are catching their attention, I bet we can predict what those are. We'll turn the program over to your questions. Uh, if you've been here before, you know um, we ask you to use the Q&A feature, write them in. We will do our best to get to as many of them as possible, but I know especially today it's going to be tricky. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. And over to you, Chris. Amanda, thanks for the great introduction. How lucky we are today to have Fiona Hill a former colleague of mine at the NSC, a friend and a world's, the world's leading expert on Ukraine and Russia. So we are very fortunate to be able to take your questions today. So I will be, uh, clearly I will be brief right up front so we have more time for questions and, and interaction between both of us. So right up front, I do want to say some of my remarks today are informed in part by conversations I've had in recent weeks with individuals that are on the ground in Ukraine today. Um, in addition to that, I want to start out by saying the Russians are not 10 feet tall. And I would make the point that throughout my career, my early career, when we very much focused on the Soviet threat, oftentimes we fell into the trap of painting them as 10 feet tall. Now we see decades later, we see a fight that's playing out in Ukraine and we see a sloppy campaign being executed by the Russians. Nonetheless, their indiscriminate killing of civilians is deeply, deeply troubling. It looks a lot like Chechnya. It looks a lot like Grozny. It looks a lot like Russian operations on the ground in Syria. All of that said, I think that I have five key points I'd like to convey. Right up front, I would make the point that there is a stalemate currently it seems to be playing out on the ground in Ukraine. We saw the early phase of the campaign executed by a war of choice by Russia, and it looked very much like a war of annihilation. It looked very much in the tradition of Clausewitz, right, that the Russians would take over Kyiv. That was their key objective, the center of gravity, if you will. And then we saw a dynamic on the ground change, and now we see that stalemate or a battle of attrition. That doesn't mean that individuals aren't gonna suffer tremendously. It just looks more like there's parity on the battlefield. And it seems that the Russians have culminated, meaning they can no longer go on a cohesive uh, uh, campaign that they were trying to achieve. Again, take Kyiv and take other major, uh, major cities on the ground in Ukraine. So that's the first, key point that we now see a stalemate that also is a bit of a slog, a war of attrition. 
but clearly this is going to be a long war. I think the Russians are settling down for a long war, and so aren't the Ukrainians. Uh, the second point I would make is the Ukrainians absolutely believe they can be victorious. They have also been bolstered by the leadership of President Zelensky. We have seen a resiliency on the part of the Ukrainian people. We have seen a stalwart defense of Ukraine, and we currently see pockets of counteroffensives now on the outskirts of Kyiv. Some of this seems anecdotal because we don't clearly understand the whole picture of what's going on in Ukraine. We don't have access to all the sources that the intelligence communities have. The, the next point I would make is this is, to put a finer point on it, a clumsy conventional uh, invasion. And the Russians are tailspinning now. They are perhaps trying to settle, or maybe it's disinformation for uh, the possibility of, of, of settling down to accept uh, separatist East Ukraine, take some of the terrain in the Donbass. As you recall, back in December, I expected on spy chat, my prediction, although I perhaps got lucky, was the fact that Russia was, was going to invade, and perhaps they would take a chunk of the Donbass, the separatist region, and try to hold it. Now there's talk this morning in multiple media outlets, the possibility of a division that the Russians are seeking of, of uh, Ukraine, split it almost down the middle. We'll see how that all plays out, but clearly the Russians are reassessing their initial campaign plan, uh, plans as a result of that tailspinning that I have already referenced. The next point I wanna make is the Russians have absolutely been sucked into a campaign they didn't plan for. And that is very apparent by the, essentially a people's war now, the Ukrainians, not only conventionally, but there are regular forces on the ground that are fighting with everything from Molotov cocktails to changing signs on the road. Those kinds of things have been reporting, in other words, to deceive, deceive the Russian army as, as their campaign plays out. And the last point I would make is the dilemma for the West, as we start to consider where we think things are going to go, is how does the West continue to deliver what it is President Zelensky and the Ukrainians need without triggering some kind of conflagration, without triggering chemical attacks, without triggering uh, ta the use of tactical nuclear weapons, which have been referenced re recently. So these are some of the things that I am, I am watching, and those are the points I wanted to make. I think also I will close by saying that President Zelensky is also offering the possibility of some meaningful diplomacy. We'll see if that is at all tenable with Russia or if they can be trusted. This is clearly in the words of General Hayden, a post-truth world. And when you consider how the Russians are behaving with their multiple levels of deception and disinformation, it is certainly a post-truth uh, Russia as articulated by Putin. In other words, he can't be trusted. So let me turn it over to Fiona, because that's who we really want to hear from today. Fiona, maybe you can offer some of your insights right up front. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, and uh, really great to be here with everyone. And um, yeah, I think the points that you laid out there are a great basis for us uh, to get started. Um, you know, you're absolutely right that uh, this campaign has not gone in the way that the Russians clearly intended at first. They were obviously planning on something of a blitzkrieg and um, thought this would all be over, you know, fairly fairly soon. There's, there even was a report of a statement, a, a speech that had been prepared for Putin to give, you know, two or three days into the campaign, remembering it started February 24th, somewhere around February 26th, the 27th, in which he was kind of laying out his rationale for having um, uh, launched this full invasion of, um, of Ukraine, clearly thinking that the uh, Ukrainian military would surrender, lay down their arms as they were asked to do, you know, right away very early on in uh, the um, initial move into Ukraine. 
and also then uh, toppling uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, and replacing him with someone else, uh, someone that the Russians have been keeping in reserve on ice, as it were, you know, to kind of truck out this uh, particular occasion. Uh, and that was clearly uh, the preferred course of action. And then, you know, we might have also seen uh, you know, a series of negotiations based on a position of strength from the Russians that might have looked along the line, some of the things that you were talking about before anyway, including the dismemberment of Ukraine, because that certainly seemed like one of the uh, key goals. People might also remember somewhere, um, you know, in the first couple of weeks, uh, President uh, Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus, who's been in on the action um, in terms of allowing Belarus to be uh, used as a staging ground, a platform for this um, invasion, having a rather bizarre press conference in which he had up a map of Ukraine that also had nearby Moldova, Moldova, the um, country to the south where an awful lot of uh, Ukrainian refugees have fled to. And uh, uh, Lukashenko is pointing at this map and it's clearly showed the dismemberment of Ukraine into multiple uh, uh, entities and also the possibility of the uh, Russians moving into Moldova, which is quite close to uh, Odessa, the fabled uh, Black Sea port uh, of Ukraine, which has also uh, been uh, designated as the target of the Russians and you know people were, uh, anticipated there for quite some time, some kind of amphibious assault on Odessa that would then you know, join up with uh, Russian troops if they'd made their way all the way down uh, the Black Sea coast. Now, it's very clear that, um, that the Russians have fallen far short of those initial goals, but it's also clear that they have uh, asserted uh, control, at least in a loose form, over some considerable swathes of territory, having pushed out of Crimea from the south, the territory that they annexed back in 2014, taking Kherson, um, a key uh, port city at the kind of neck of, uh, of the peninsula and uh, uh, commanding some of the entry points into the kind of the Black Sea. They've also, of course, led siege in a rather horrific way to um, a series of towns uh, along the Sea of Azov, where, which is the um, enclave of sea that um, is entered into by the Kerch Strait. Uh, that is um, basically hemmed in by Ukrainian territory, Crimea and, and Russia. And uh, those uh, chain of ports, including Mariupol, which has been horribly devastated, Melitopol, uh, Berdyansk and, and others, which are starting to border onto the secessionist republics of uh, the, the Donbass region, um, have been um, you know, very much led siege uh, by the Russian military. There also seems to be, you know, quite a bit of an attempt by the Russians still to head off um, Ukrainian forces, keep them pinned down, uh, perhaps on the um, old line of contact um, uh, with the Donbass region, and also, um, you know, keep them pulled towards Kiev, where the Russians now appear to be um, uh, basically consolidating and, and, and digging down. So, you know, Putin has not, uh, as of yet, changed um, his overall objective of uh, trying to seize Ukraine by force and potentially dismember it, although any kind of occupation of Ukraine looks um, extraordinarily difficult and far off. And Putin keeps telling everybody that he has not changed his goals and that all is going according to plan. Now, Chris, you know, you pointed out that lots of things have happened that um, uh, clearly the campaign and Putin didn't plan for. Now, Putin um, uh, is an operative uh, from the security services, and he's something of a contingency planner, not uh, you know a planner where one thinks that everything will go right. And Chris, you've done plenty of contingency planning in your time as well um, in the job that you and I uh, you know, co coordinated on at the um, NSC. That was part of your work was thinking through contingency plans and you know how you adapt uh, policies if uh, things go wrong. Putin's view as an operative from the security services is that all of the plans or the best led plans go um, awry on the, basically the first contact or the kind of first day and you have to be constantly adapting. I think he clearly assumes that he can keep adapting, even if the costs are pretty high. There are several things that he didn't factor in. A lot of this is the depth and extent of the economic response that we've had from uh, the uh, from the West and from Europe. But I think he did, you know, anticipate that things would go around wrong on the ground and is trying to now figure out how to adapt and to, um, you know, change course, perhaps, you know, um, change some of the goalposts for now, uh, move them around. And whatever um, we um, achieve in terms of uh, a ceasefire, 
uh, on which we could build some negotiations, I think we're going to have to bear in mind that this will only be temporary from Putin's point of view. I was involved back in the day in the 1990s in the negotiations to end the first war in Chechnya. I was a junior member of a larger negotiating team and we helped to broker uh, what people will have forgotten by now was the Hasevyot Accord, which was supposed to find a compromise between Russia and Chechnya, uh, some different degrees of Chechen's autonomy uh, within the Russian Federation, because Chechnya was, of course, part of Russia that was trying to secede, not an independent sovereign country like Ukraine has been for the last 30 years. But the Russians were in no mood uh, for compromise. They had um, uh, basically reached um, not just a stalemate, but rather a bit of a political and um, military defeat at the end of the first Chechen war in uh, the late 1990s. And they wanted basically to regroup and reassess. So, you know, those of us who were negotiating thought, you know, initially that actually we had managed to craft something, but we were told by uh, one of uh, the senior uh, Russians who was involved in the negotiations, Alexei Arbatov, you know, who was actually known as a you know, pretty reasonable guy, that we should not think that this was peace by any means and that the Russians, as soon as they had uh, basically had a chance to uh, get their act together, would come back and finish the job, which is exactly what happened in 1999. And Putin, you know, as you were alluding to, Chris, rose to the presidency, uh, having been the head of the FSB, uh, the uh, successor entity to the KGB, which was put in charge of actually finishing off the war in um, Chechnya by some pretty dirty, ruthless means. He rose to the back of uh, to the presidency on the back of that renewed war in Chechnya, including what many think were some flat, false flag operations to blow up some residential buildings with some pretty high casualties in Russian cities that re-triggered off and uh, created a justification for the renewal of war. And of course, what we had at the end um, of uh, the second Chechen war was not a compromise with the uh, those who had tried to secede early on in 1994, but was a Russian imposed peace with a Russian imposed leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, who then, you know, turned Chechnya into the place that we see today, which is a pretty brutal uh, uh, approximation of what uh, Chechnya had been before. And of course, the rub is that Ramzan Kadyrov's uh, forces, the Kadyrovtsi, who are part of the Russian Guard uh, forces, the National Guard, the Raskvadia, are also now fighting in Ukraine, where they are playing out their skills on urban uh, combat and seem to be pretty motivated in fighting on behalf of Putin, uh, more so than Russia, uh, to whom they actually have a debt of fealty. I mean, it was really kind of medieval and it's set up that we see in Chechnya. There's another element to this as well, because of course, um, uh, Moscow, the Kremlin, Putin, they oversaw the complete leveling of the capital city of Grozny. They were quite happy to stand in the rubble, the complete devastation of what had actually been a Russian city. And uh, most of the casualties were frankly Russian speakers uh, as a way of punishing and subjugating the region. We also have to remember that uh, Putin uh, presided over the intervention in Syria in 2015 to make sure that Bashar al-Assad did not fall. Uh, in 2015, um, as Chris and other people listening will remember, uh, just ahead of that um, intervention, Assad looked like he was going to go. Remember, we all said Assad must go. Uh, there was um, a fixation on uh, getting him out um, of uh, Syria, given the devastation and the brutality of the civil war. The Russians intervened, more brutality, the flattening of Aleppo, um, absolutely, you know, incredible levels of uh, devastation uh, to the Syrian economy and, you know, Assad is still standing there uh, despite all of the casualties and the clear opposition to him amidst all the rubble and has, um, you know, seven years on has been out and about, in fact, in polite companies, they say, in the Middle East in visiting um, regional rulers. So, look, I think that um, Putin right now is still thinking that he can survive this. Uh, the big issue, you know, of course, is the longer term, uh, not just what happens in Ukraine and all the issues, Chris, that you laid out, but also what happens over the longer term in Russia itself. As I said, Putin did not factor in the um, devastation to the Russian economy. Sanctions are intended to be uh, a point of leverage to try to halt the hostilities. But there is also um, an element that is going to have long term implications for Russia here because many um, companies uh, in the private sector have pulled out. 
um, of Russia of their own accord because of reputational risk, uh, their own adherence to, um, you know, the ESG of environment and, you know, um, social responsibility and good governance that uh, so many co uh, companies are basing themselves on now. It's not just in response uh, to the sanctions by the United States and Europe. Admittedly, there are other places, China, India, uh, Turkey, um, you know, and our NATO allies who have not um, got on board on uh, sanctions, but they're also uh, being much more hesitant in their interactions with Russia. And the cumulative effect of this is going to be basically setting Russia back, uh, certainly back beyond the 22 years that Putin has been in power to the more uncertain economic periods of uh, the 1990s. And there's a good question about what impact that will have on Russia, including on the Russian military over the longer term. So there's a lot of different things to factor in here. I'll stop because I want us to be able to have a discussion about this. I just wanted to flag a few issues in addition to the points uh, that you had made, Chris, and also, of course, very interested in hearing uh, what people's questions may be. But I, I think, you know, the, the point of this is, look, I don't know, just as um, nobody else really knows what the end game is going to be, what this is going to look like when it's over and again, it may be a temporary phase that we're going to have to really keep thinking about the long term and adapting um, our own uh, policies and approaches to this and trying to be as flexible as possible and really focusing in hard on diplomacy to try to uh, um, at least get the hostilities uh, to end uh, and you know bring uh, some uh, thing of an end to the current uh, levels of carnage. I think Chris is coming back. Oh, so there he is. Hey, Fiona, that was absolutely tremendous. And that's why we had you today at Spy Chat. Thank you very much uh, for opening it up with, with those uh, powerful remarks. So you actually answered in part one of my questions. So what I would like to do, I'm going to uh, reassess as you finish <laughs> up. I have another question. But first, let me start off by recommending, and this is a bit of a tradition we have with Spy Chat, recommending your book title, There is Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. It's an extraordinary book. It's a personal narrative. It's about policy, but it's really a personal story that really resonated with me, having known you at the NSC and having watched you since. So I really encourage our audience reads it. It's an excellent book. It's an excellent story. And uh, it, it, it's, in some points, it was, uh, it was emotional for me to, to, to read some of your narratives. So thank you for that. So I strongly encourage our guests to pick up the book. Um, also, we're going to give you a link, uh, certainly, uh, not the highlight of my my recommendations for reading, but I do encourage you to take a look at an article that I've written about resistance, because I believe that NATO has a role for supporting resistance efforts on the ground in Ukraine, and certainly the United States can play a much bigger role in resistance. So I wrote a piece uh, that has resonated with intelligence officers on the ground in Ukraine, Ukrainians, I'm told, um, have have read it and uh, offered their perspectives that the message resonates. The timing might not be right, but we should be thinking in terms of if Putin does in fact put in a puppet government in portions of Ukraine, not necessarily Kyiv, but remember we were early on, there was some reporting that there was the possibility of a government in exile. In other words, President Zelensky, there may have been a contingency, um, as Fiona just talked about. We're fond of contingencies as well in the West, and the contingency may very well have been a government in exile. It doesn't seem that that's in the cards right now because of how resolute and resilient the Ukrainians have been. But there are going to be portions, in all likelihood, of Ukraine that the Putin is going to install some puppets in it. At least that'll be his objective. If that does happen, there are ways to resist that. We have a history in the United States of conducting unconventional warfare. And I just make the case that the West can support those efforts. I'm not talking about conventional means. I'm talking about unconventional warfare. So you take a look at that article. And lastly, my question for Fiona is certainly we don't know how this is going to end, but do you think President Zelensky 
is in a position to more amenable to some negotiation, to some concessions with Russia. We've heard a little bit about neutrality just in the four, last 48, 72 hours, I believe. Do you think he is willing to make some significant concessions uh, to Putin to avoid further bloodshed? Just your perspectives on the diplomatic instruments in play right now. Well, look, Zelensky has always made it very clear right from the very beginning of his presidency that one of his goals was um, to find some kind of solution to all of the confrontational relations with Russia. So actually one of his campaign um, promises was, uh, unfortunately, obviously didn't um, uh, come to fruition, was to try to make peace with Russia over Donbass and try to find, you know, some formula uh, for Crimea. Uh, and he's been clear throughout the entire conflict uh, for this last several weeks uh, that he was um, willing to negotiate and that he would put you know, certain issues on the table for consideration and discussion. Now, look, I mean, clearly Zelensky also has um, uh, Ukrainians to bear in mind as well. I mean, look, the big difference between Ukraine and Russia, and one in which uh, is one is which is one of the reasons I think that Putin's coming down so hard on them is Ukraine is a pretty horizontally networked society. So, you know, um, Zelensky wasn't particularly popular as a president um, uh, before the war, and he's risen to, you know, incredible statue as a result of it. But no Ukrainian president has ever been particularly popular. And there's been multiple changes in presidency in uh, uh, Ukraine, some by elections, some because of street demonstrations. And Ukrainian history has always been replete of this. I mean, Ukraine has a complicated uh, and but very rich history. Um, it's, you know, renowned uh, for its Cossacks and, uh, you know, what we would be used to the, in the um, old days used to call freebooters. I always thought was a kind of a great expression. I mean, basically people who ran off, you know, to get away from centralized overbearing authority. You know, the, uh, it was the home of runaway serfs uh, from, uh, you know, the rest of the Russian Empire, for example. It's uh, got a history of incursions by all kinds of other would-be empires and other states and uh, a, a history of fierce resistance and partisan warfare. So, you know, Zelensky has to reckon with his own people as well and those around him. You know, one of the issues um, in Ukraine is that, you know, if we were talking about the um, uh, the government in exile, there's also a lot of people who could step up to fill Zelensky's shoes, not in the same way as he's performed, actually. He's proven to be an amazing wartime president, in part because of his skills as an actor, even as a comedian. I think they've, you know, come in uh, into play in a really meaningful and um, very effective way. But there are others who have been prime ministers and presidents and all who of whom are now uh, equally committed to Ukraine's resilience and to fighting back against uh, the Russian invasion. So that actually gives Ukraine quite a bit of strength. And I do think that if, you know, can Zelensky can frame this in a kind of a, a national discussion, making sure that he's, you know, keeping up with the mood of not just the people around him, but, you know, kind of the larger population as much as he can, then he might be able to be in a position to find some formula here. The issue is whether the Russians are willing to compromise, and that gets back to the points that I made about Hasivyot. The Russians were only then making a temporary truce. Um, Alexei Abatov told us very clearly, we were kind of thinking that, you know, at the time, that maybe there was something more to it because we'd been planning on a referendum, you know, trying to sort of think about, you know, a certain kind of phased sort of sequencing for uh, Chechen autonomy and status. You know, those would all make sense for questions about Crimea and the Donbass. But that not may not be, you know, what Putin is in uh, the mood for. And, you know, one point that's been made by, you know, a number of uh, military commentators, including Michael Coffin, who I'm sure a lot of people have been following, is that Russia hasn't thrown its full military might at uh, Ukraine at this juncture. There has not been for example, the political decision made to fully um, mobilize, even though there's, you know, obviously a lot of military personnel have been sent there and a lot of equipment, but to make this clearly a war, they're still calling it the special military operation. And if there was political mobilization behind this and the whole future of Russia was said to be at stake, and there's all kinds of veiled warnings about that, we might see something even more brutal. Because I think what Putin um, has made it very clear is he wants to have the full recognition of Crimea as um, 
part of Russia and he would say there's already been a referendum, although we would say uh, not exactly, certainly not one that was um, internationally administered. Uh, and um, he wants to have the full recognition of independence for Donetsk and Luhansk, the two regions. And uh, Russia, or let's just say Russian proxies, only um, held about 35% of those territories uh, prior to February 24th. So there's obviously uh, a major swathe of those territories uh, that has been um, uh, under Ukrainian hands and is contested. And so if Russia is sticking at this and um, is insisting on those kinds of recognitions as part of some formula for even a temporary truce, that's going to make it very hard. And I think a lot of this now depends, and it gets back to your point, Chris, about resistance and the ability of uh, the Ukrainians to counter the Russian offensive as it, as it is already, and the effect of our diplomacy. Because one of the key issues is, can we be very clear to the rest of the world about what is happening here? We're still seeing a lot of skepticism, a lot of fence sitting, uh, a lot of resistance uh, by even some of our partners uh, and countries that we have you know, reasonably good relations with in the Middle East and um, in Asia, you know, for example, who are not yet ready to buy into you know, the actual truth of the matter, which is this is a post-colonial, post-imperial grab by uh, Russia, you know, to try to, you know, retake territories that Putin um, thinks belong inside of the Russian Empire. And of course, we know that most of the countries around the world, ourselves included, are the products of the disintegrations of empires or fights for independence from empires. So this would, uh, you know, cross a pretty serious threshold. There's also one thing that I want to flag from a discussion I had with some other colleagues earlier this morning, that one of our our um, uh, fellow um, uh, analysts uh, was um, was flagging for everyone and highlighting is that the Russian Duma, the Russian Parliament, is now considering a resolution declaring Belarusians and Ukrainians to be Russians. Now that really um, crosses a, a significant threshold there, uh, not just for uh, regional developments. Um, in, in Europe, but more broadly, if um, you know that resolution is put into play. Now we have plenty of non-binding resolutions coming out of the U.S. Congress. You know, some of which are just clearly, you know, performance politics. But in this instance, this would be um, really upping the ante and the stakes here. Putin's already uh, tried to reclaim the 25 million Russians more, I suppose now, you know, with given birth rates who found themselves stranded by the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the new um, independent states. But now declaring Belarusians and Ukrainians to be Russians, uh, you know, which of course they were sort of considered to be different categories within the, the Russian Empire, is really uh, moving things into um, a whole different sphere, sphere. And I think that we have to be extraordinarily mindful and watchful uh, about you know what might happen next as a result of that. That's excellent. Thank you, Fiona. I think we're going to let Amanda field some questions or send some questions to us to field rather, curate them. I guess. Go ahead. Yes, Amanda. we have uh, we have a lot of really good questions. So everyone, forgive me in advance if I don't get to yours. Um, but a question that came in very early. Do you think that Putin is actually getting accurate information, accurate numbers on casualties and reports of setbacks? Is he ignoring them if he is, or is he just forging ahead? Well, <laughs> uh, Chris and I know how difficult it is um, to brief, um, let's just say, you know, higher ups in uh, politics. You know, all of my jobs that I've had in the National Intelligence Corps and the NSC, um, you know, you can give uh, people as much information as you like and they may not want to take it uh, for a whole variety of reasons. It may be that they've already made their mind up on a course of action and they don't want to be swayed and they figure out that they'll deal with um, these risks and warnings that you're bringing to them as they go along. It may be that they also assess that it's worth the risks and the costs. So it may well be in the case of uh, Putin that yes, he's getting all of this information or as much of the information is apparent. I, I, in terms of the casualty um, figures, given on some of the anecdotal information that we have, they may not have the full figures for example, because, you know, there's the fog of war. I mean, Chris can, you know, speak uh, to this, I think, you know, very directly. 
Uh, there's not someone going around making a head count, a you know, pretty gruesome and horrifying head count, because we don't know also the casualties in terms of Ukraine as well. I mean, this is still uh, the battlefield. And, you know, uh, as somebody was pointing out again in this conversation I referenced earlier, you know, we're still reassessing numbers from previous conflicts. You know, remember about World War II, there's always an estimate about what the casualties were in World War II, because you had civilian casualties, military casualties, you know, um, it was always, you know, very hard to um, dissemble and, uh, and uh, disassemble rather all, all the different uh, casualty figures. You know, the question is who's killed and who's injured as well. Often Russians casualty figures conflate those two. So um, the casualty figures look might seem high, but the deaths uh, may be smaller. I mean, we know ourselves from our wars that um, uh, in, in the case of battlefield injuries, a lot more people have survived than would have done in the past. The casualty rate in terms of injuries is really high, but the death rate uh, remains quite low. This might not be the case in Ukraine, but it may well be, as I said, that Putin, if he's got um, high casualty figures, may still decide that's worth the cost, because it depends on what the political impact of these is from his assessment. What the Russians have learned from you know years of um, other conflicts, intervention in Syria, earlier interventions in Ukraine, you know, for example, is that if the casualties are spread across the country, you know, from, um, you know, different groups, then, uh, you know, it's a huge country, Russia, an enormous country, uh, you know, then those figures can actually be hit. The problem is when there's concentrations and pockets of casualties, very high rates coming from specific regions and specific towns. And of course, we saw from Chechnya and also one well, in Afghanistan that that had a big impact. But in Chechnya, you got an organization uh, that uh, coalesced um, around the casualty figures, an understandable one that Soldiers' Mothers, Soldiers' Mothers Committee, and it became a very powerful group, a watchdog in Russia after the Chechen wars. Now, Putin has moved to dismantle that. And also the other important uh, non-governmental organization, Memorial or Memorial, uh, that also looked into the kind of the crimes of the Stalin period and into kind of abuses of power by uh, the Russian government and was also very active around Chechnya as well. Now, all of those have been in uh, the advance of this invasion rolled back. So Putin clearly anticipates that there could be some consequences of this, was tried to literally decapitate um, all of the watchdog groups and those who might um, protest against it. So for now, it may well be that he's um, uh, basically going on regardless and is basically trying to figure out what some of the political reactions would be and then to deal with those consequences through more repression at home. The only thing I would add, that's a great articulation. The only thing I would add is I, I suspect Putin, and this is conjecture on my part, but I suspect that he has a good sense for what's happening on the ground in Ukraine. That's why, that's why we've heard some reporting that uh, FSB senior leaders have been moved out of their positions or they're in house arrest. So they're bringing him bad news. He doesn't like the bad news and he's lashing out at some of his seniors to include maybe his minister of defense. So I think he's seeing the reporting. They're not holding back and he's not liking what he's seeing, but I don't think it's beyond his, his uh, style or approach to try to deceive the Russian people as to the extent of casualties on the ground. But there yeah, will be happening. And his speeches have suggested, right, Chris, that he's doubled down on that. I mean, right. basically saying, look, we'll just have to put up with it because his narrative is, is the West is out to get us. And that's right. where I worry if, if that narrative moves into this is a battle for Russia's survival and it goes beyond Ukraine and that that then, um, you know, there could be even more uh, military action, devastating action in Ukraine. And that's when we get into these other contingencies, Chris, that you worried about the use of tactical nuclear weapons. He's had the former president and former prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, talk about the use of tactical uh, nuclear weapons in the event of um, uh, an existential threat to Russia, which might be not just in a conventional military sense, but could be, you know, if they're arguing that we're trying to destroy their economy. So, you know, again, these are all things that we should be very concerned about. And clearly, you know, the administration and others of our allies should be talking about, you know, how we're going to respond to things like that very, um, you know, behind the scenes in a, in a meaningful way. And, you know, obviously I do think everyone's taking this seriously.
that plays right into a question a guest asked about, you know, if Putin is extremely frustrated, um, might this result in a nuclear escalation, which you, you just touched upon? And would the Russian leadership be willing to permit such an escalation? Well, if we're talking about the immediate circle around Putin and him being the key decision maker, I think only a very small handful of people uh, came up with this invasion plan. So yes, they were definitely contemplated. That's why Medvedev is um, talking about this. There are all kinds of different ways one could speculate. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, you know, for example, re released um, an essay that they'd published years ago on this very idea, because we've seen the Russians talk about this for quite some time. We've seen them exercise in contingencies where a localized conflict becomes something larger and regional, where they get concerned about a NATO intervention and they use a tactical nuclear weapon to do what we call escalate to de-escalate, to in other words, to get us all to back off. Now, if we look at this in a larger global context, of course, the threshold that they would uh, cross is pretty significant and pretty disturbing because we haven't had the use of a nuclear weapon since World War II, since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we've actually said that the, that the horrors of that period uh, were, was, were so overwhelming that we would make every effort not to use any kind of nuclear weapon again. And that was kind of part of the frame for the strategic balance. Putin would rupture to that completely. He would also cross a threshold that I think would put the non-proliferation treaty in jeopardy. We're supposed to be have a non-proliferation treaty review uh, coming up in this summer, I think it's August, but we've um, we've postponed that many times. I mean, Chris and I will remember working on that, you know, back when we were in the NSC and trying to figure out how we would handle it. Because since the days of the Cold War, we've of course had the proliferation of nuclear weapons. It's not just the P5, China, the United States, Russia, the UK and France anymore with nuclear weapons. We've got um, India and Pakistan. We've got all kinds of countries that we kind of know they have, but we're not supposed to say they have. We've got North Korea uh, basically testing uh, missiles out and uh, putting the world in nuclear jeopardy. We're trying to get to a final agreement uh, for, again, a revised uh, agreement with Iran because of its uh, nuclear uh, weapons, uh, uh, basically, program. And if Putin and the, the Russian military use a tactical nuclear weapon in this kind of context to get all of us to back off, then you can be pretty sure that every country in the world that's been contemplating having a nuclear weapon will go for it because it, it clearly becomes, uh, um, in, in a way, the proof of success in a, uh, in a military operation, but also perhaps your best line of defense. Because everyone is now talking about the fact that Ukraine, like Belarus and Kazakhstan, inherited a very large strategic nuclear arsenal from the collapse of the Soviet Union because of the stationing of many of the ICBMs on their territories. And if Ukraine had not given up those nuclear weapons, and that was a major US goal after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, because we were worried about these kinds of contingencies as well, uh, Russia was uh, not would, would not have been so likely to invade Ukraine if Ukraine was in fact a nuclear state. So this would open up the proverbial Pandora's box. So I think we have to get ahead of it uh, and in a diplomatic uh, fashion. We've got to be out there talking to China and everyone else, uh, particularly the you know the other major nuclear powers and others that you know we've recognised as nuclear powers, uh, to basically go through all the consequences. This would make the world a lot less safe place for everyone if Putin does this. It won't be just about Russia and Ukraine or Russia and Europe. It will change the whole global calculus on nuclear weapons. Yeah, I would just add that uh, just from a historical context, and and uh, certainly Fiona knows this, she lived it. We, as we studied the, the Soviet doctrine, we expected them to use tactical nuclear weapons. We also expected and we trained uh, to to work in, in essentially protective gear. Uh, and we were very concerned with uh, biological and chemical attacks. So that was a part, that's not any consolation to Ukrainians on the ground or Europeans today, but we expected that use on the battlefields in, in, in the 1980s and before that. So it's important to remember the context here. Uh, but it's a very dangerous time, as Fiona just articulated. 
Now, um, one guest asked if Russia can survive on support from China, Turkey, Israel, and other countries still dependent on Russian oil. And of course, I think there was an article today showing how far reaching Russian oil is, not just those countries, but, but many European countries have, as well. But can they survive? With well, the look, it's, it's a really important question. Um, you know, obviously, um, Russia uh, gains an, an awful lot of revenue for the state uh, from oil sales. Um, I mean, it used to be the case that um, anything um, over $27 a barrel um, uh, of an oil price went directly to the state coffers. Now, the, the value of um, the Euro's blend oil has dropped considerably because, of, of course, there's not the same demand for it. So it's very possible for other countries to be, be able to pick um, you know, this up for a discount. But you know, the other kind of question is how much they're factoring in um, you know, US sanctions. Now, the oil sector isn't sanctioned, but an awful lot of companies are already making decisions uh, you know, not to purchase. And the Russians have also insisted that any um, future contracts be in rubles, which, you know, may, you know, obviously to uh, keep up the, the value of the ruble, which is important internally because all of the military and all of the kind of payments are made in rubles internally. But of course, it does cut off a lot of the foreign exchange um, earnings, uh, hard currency earnings for uh, for Russia. It's a pretty complicated uh, set of issues here and you know, people obviously monitoring this really closely. I mean, the, 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 not just oil, of course, it's gas and also coal uh, and the hydrocarbons that Russia produces in pretty significant amounts. Uh, Russia produces special fuel coal for power uh, generation, for example, and Germany uh, was quite dependent on that for its power generation, not just from their own coal, but also um, that's used in metallurgy, you know, for, um, for steel uh, and uh, aluminum uh, production, for example, and all that has to be replaced, which means that that's out there on the market as well. Now, oil prices have been going up uh, because of constrained uh, production. So, you know, if, if Russia, um, you know, uh, is, uh, does still have customers I and mean, it can still uh, make, um, you know, a certain amount of revenue from this, then it would have to peg the budget to it. But it's all the kind of knock on effects of the other sanctions that are pretty critical here. When people say, can Russia survive? Of course, Russia can survive. Um, I mean, the, the economy might, um, you know, kind of flatline. Uh, but then the kind of question is, it's these uh, trade offs. But if the trade-off for Putin is security and is trying to kind of keep the military going and there's still a somewhat limited campaign, then Russia can uh, keep press ahead. The question is really what the political response is going to be and the response from the population who are going to get really hurt by all of this. I mean, our war is not with the Russian population, um, but the effects of this war in Ukraine, or I saw that the war is not with the Russian um, population, but the effects of the war in Ukraine are going to have some pretty serious knock-on effects. It's going to be the average Russian who's going to be, you know, hurt a lot more than the actual state itself. Some of the bigger issues, though, are going to be coming back, and Chris might have a comment on this, on the sanctions on critical components. Um, there's quite a lot of threads out on the internet by, you know, various military analysts talking about how earlier waves of sanctions in 2014 that hit, you know, components for the Russian military did actually hold back some of the modernization of uh, Russian weaponry and some new generation of, of weapons. And this time around, with more far reaching sanctions, particularly on US components uh, for uh, particular parts and spare parts for um, all kinds of uh, machinery and planes and things, for example, uh, then the, the Russians will get um, hard hit. We've seen uh, reports on the civilian aviation um, uh, fleet, for example, talking about they're going to have to cannibalize some of the planes that they've leased, you know, rather than giving them back because they're going to have a really hard time for spare parts. We've seen that for Iran, you know, for example, in the period of sanctions, we've seen Venezuela and other countries having a hard time. So it's not going to be that easy, you know, kind of for the Russians to manage. But Putin's basically said to all the technocrats around him, you better figure this out. Yeah, I think uh, to your point, Fiona, just to follow up, it, yeah, focusing on the components, the parts, the repair, that's going to hurt Russia on, uh, currently, and I think that will have long-term ramifications as well. We want to prevent ru future Russian capabilities as well as current capabilities, so I think those that level of detail, that level of focus, rather, on sanctions that 
uh, target military technologies or technologies dual use are very important. We've seen the impact on Iran, for example. So I think that's very important. So that's a great point you made. So I like this because it uses the word optimism. And where do you see grounds for optimism on Western support? What is, where do you see gaps or complacency? Well, I think we've um, talked rather a lot about uh, many of the gaps. And I mean, look, there is no room for complacency at all here. Um, so many things could happen. There are so many ways in which this could get worse. I think we've laid out um, quite a lot of them. We shouldn't, um, you know, start kind of looking at every front, you know, for Putin to be defeated either. Um, you know, irrespective of what um, the president uh, said, um, you know, about Putin staying in power. I mean, everyone's thinking, how can we possibly, you know, have a different situation if Putin is still in power? I mean, 22 years he's been in power. He could he could stay in power till 2036, you know, the current plan of basically two more, two, six, uh, two more six-year terms. He has to put himself up for presidential election in 2024. I mean, he could declare martial law as a result of, you know, the war, you know, for example, and suspend elections. He also could get re-elected. Uh, because, you know, the, the propaganda uh, and repression are such that there is still, you know, quite a swathe of support in Russia for now. I mean, a lot of people who don't support have left. I mean, we're seeing people leaving in droves. But, you know, the people around him are, are, are also hunkering down because they all rise and fall together. And there's an awful lot of people you have to think about invested in this Russian system. I mean, one thing is about 60 percent of the Russian workforce is on uh, basically on the state um accounts one way or another either in state-owned enterprises or working for the russian bureaucracy so there's an uh, if putin can keep on paying the bills in some fashion for the 60 percent you know people who work for the state one way or another and that's obviously includes the military and the military industrial complex or the manufacturing you know sector that's kind of like tied into all of that you know people they've already committed to him I mean, we see in our own politics, one people make a commitment and look, and in all kinds of life, often people make a commitment and they don't want to be, um, you know, basically pushed away from it. And a lot of people still don't really believe uh, the, the Western version of what's happening. Uh, it's, it's very hard for information to penetrate. Uh, they believe that the United States and NATO and the West and Europe are all to blame for all of this, that the Ukrainians were provoking the United States. I mean, I've talked to Russian friends who, you know, have basically been saying, well, look, there were two sides to all of this. You know, we had all these refugees from the Donbass. I mean, that, of course, pales in comparison with the millions of people who were uh, displaced in uh, Ukraine, including half of the ch the child population of Ukraine, half half of the children of Ukraine are now refugees. I mean, that, that beggars imagination. And, you know, it's tens of thousands in, in the Donbass, you know, for that conflict. I mean, a lot of people have died in the Donbass as well. I mean, it been 14,000 people, you know, died over this period of time. But from the Russian perspective, that's all they see. They see carnage and slaughter in Donbass. They actually don't believe, uh, you know, the, what's happening on the ground in Ukraine. They have their own version of it. So it's entirely possible that Putin could, like Assad, you know, basically play this out and get himself re-elected and still be, you know, in power a few years from now. The optimism <laughs> comes in if we can really keep our act together on the diplomacy and pushing back. And, you know, uh, Chris's point about resilience and resoluteness and uh, resistance um, on the ground from the Ukrainians. Um, I heard a group of Finns tell some pretty senior Ukrainians a few weeks ago, look, you're going to have to fight. That's what we had to do. Finland prevailed in the Winter War, very different, of course, in the 1940s from what it is now. They lost a vast swathe of their territory in Karelia, but they've been an independent you know, state um, ever since. Uh, and the Russians have you know, trod carefully with Finland because they know the Finns are, are willing to fight. They'll have learned this now about Ukraine. But it's really going to take an all out international global effort to get this to stop. So I think we have to the optimism is that we can make this work by continuing you know, to kind of work on every diplomatic channel. We've got to really you know, focus on this. And if we stay unified, we have to stay unified with our um, uh, allies. But we also have to stay unified internally. And that's one area where I do worry. I mean, we've seen an awful lot of bipartisan committee on this. We've also got our own midterm elections and we've got our own election in 2024. And that's when things could break down. But we've got to relearn 
as we knew in the um, Cold War, and this is something that you know Chris and I have often worried about, we worried about when we were at the NSC, is that foreign policy should be a non-partisan uh, issue. It should be that you know we have a consensus on foreign policy. We must not politicize it. And so the only way uh, that we um, you know basically push back against is to staying unified on the approach as well and not start the blame game at home for who did what to whom and how did this uh, you know all play out and who's to blame for it because we a unified response is the only way that we actually successfully push back is um is Russia engaging in hostage diplomacy with our poor basketball player, Brittany Griner? Well, sadly, it's not just Brittany Griner. And, you know, I feel for her, I mean, in so many ways. Um, I mean, she was returning to Russia, it seems, when she was taken. Obviously, um, you know, uh, not a great timing to go back, but I think you know an awful lot of people weren't listening to the warnings, although you know it was pretty clear at the point when she went back uh, that uh, the administration were actually telling people to leave, uh, and that the, they were warning about imminent hostilities. But I mean, I guess you know the sports world people, you know, were not kind of reacting in the same way that they might in the diplomatic and um, security frames. But look, she um, is now in the company, you know, very sadly of other Americans. We have uh, two other American citizens um, who have been um, held um, uh, in very um, dubious circumstances, both former Marines who were set up uh, uh, basically uh, and, and taken, Paul Whelan and uh, Trevor Reed. And uh, Trevor Reed was basically um, uh, taken in for um, uh, some um, drunken disorderly conduct and has now found himself in a penal colony. He was clearly plied with drinks, uh, spiked drinks. I mean, it's very obvious, you know, the way that these were all set up. Paul Whelan was accused of spying, having been clearly set up as well. I mean, this all happened, um, particularly with Paul Whelan, um, while Chris and I were the National Security Council, and there was every effort made, you know, to try to um, do deal with this. But it was also made very clear by our Russian interlocutors that they were being held as pawns for leverage. And I don't know, you know, kind of what the um, rationale has been given for um, Brittany Griner behind the scenes. I mean, clearly this could have been handled in um, in a different way. Um, it's it's tragic and terrible, and I think it should be a very clear lesson uh, to anybody um, about who are uh, contemplating going to Russia. I mean, we've still got um, you know American citizens who are married to Russians who are still there as well, and I think that you know they're they're all in uh, at some considerable risk. Um, and, you know, it's one of these things that, you know, we've warned for, for quite some time about the risks of doing business um, in, uh, in Russia, particularly over, you know, the last couple of years as the tensions uh, started to mount. And this has made it very clear. I mean, my heart goes out when I really hope that we can get this resolved behind the scenes. Yeah, I'll just jump in there. Our guests would know that I often talk about hostages and wrongfully detained Americans overseas and, and foreign partners who, who have their citizens wrongfully detained. Unfortunately, set aside Russia for a second, we also have other nations like China, Iran, using hostage as a form, a malign form of diplomacy. Syria will not acknowledge holding Austin Tice, for example. So unfortunately, the trajectory, uh, in my humble view, uh, disappointingly, will increase. It is uh, working for some of these states, or they perceive it to be working, and there are a lot of nonprofits that I've been associated with or am associated with that are working to educate the public and, and to, to educate journalists as well on the risks and hazards uh, of being held detained. And that's another disturbing trend. It seems that journalists are being targeted in yep. Ukraine. Uh, so this is also a troublesome trend um, and it's concerning. So thank you very much for that question. There's also a related issue. Um, there's been a lot of reports of um, women and children others being taken from Donbass um, or in some of the regions that the um, Russian military have now occupied and then taken to Russia. And, um, you know, that that in itself is also disturbing because it's uh, not clear that they've been, you know, um, uh, taken willingly. 
you know, as, as refugees. And in fact, there was a lot of refusal of people to um, go across humanitarian uh, corridors into Russia. And, and it, clearly they can also be used as pawns. So this is, you know, kind of um, captive peoples in many respects. The Russians have a long history of deportations, by the way, of people going back to World War II. Crimean Tatars, Volga Germans, there's a whole host of um, you know, Chechens um, as well, of people being um, deported um, to Central Asia and not allowed to uh, return to their homes. So, um, you know, we also have to bear in mind that the Russians are doing this on the battlefield as well. Do you want to take 30 seconds each and comment on where you feel that China is in support of Russia? Are they on the fence? Where are they? And, and then we'll wrap it up. I, I'll jump in there just to give Fiona a, a moment. I would make the case that there will be some buyer's remorse on the part of China. I think that they are stu still a a nation that is inextricably linked to the global market place. The time isn't right for some kind of invasion of uh, Taiwan across the, the Straits. I really think China is still playing a wait and see game. And I think ultimately they're watching, they're assessing, they're looking at how the United States responds, how NATO responds. And I think they might have a bit of a buyer's remorse on their linkage or perceived linkage for bolstering Russia. That's my perception. That might be in the column of optimism as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I share that. But of course, you know, not being a China <clears throat> scholar, I also defer to those who, you know, are and who are, you know, watching it very closely. But I will say that, um, you know, China has become extraordinarily involved in, in this conflict, perhaps, you know, um, not by design. In, in ways that I think we could not have anticipated uh, prior to this, China has now become a major security factor in European um, uh, politics and the European political space, because that February 4th agreement with Russia and the statement talking about um, a relationship with Russia that knew no limits and the very pointed comments about NATO expansion from China and China essentially saying to Russia, we've got your back just, you know, a, a, a couple of weeks before this massive invasion has now put China right into um, into Europe. Europe, of course, has had China you know, present there for quite some time as an economic actor and there'd been concerns about growing political influence of, on the behalf of China, you know, trying to sort of manipulate politics behind the scenes, being seen to kind of bribe politicians in um, certain ways uh, of which we've seen elsewhere um, in the world where China has been extraordinarily active in Africa and um, Asia and Latin America, for example. But I think it was, um, you know, a bit of a shock, certainly was to me, in the way that China jumped in with both feet into the European security arena. Because now, in many respects, China is responsible for this as well. And so I think, you know, China has a lot of explaining to do to Europe. And China has benefited immensely over um, all of this time since it joined the uh, WTO back in 2010, you know, since uh, the um, global economic uh, crisis and, you know, the financial implosion of the United States, it has benefited enormously from trading with Europe, uh, not just with the United States and other Western countries, but part of China's rise, its meteoric rise has been because of its ability to export to Europe. And I think now there's going to be a lot of concerns on the part of Europeans about what does it now mean to be basically trading with Europe. And that's on top of the rupture of all the supply chains because of COVID and a lot of anxiety now about how much we had outsourced so much of our vital medical and other equipment, uh, you know, sort of day-to-day uh, amenities uh, to uh, production sites in China and a rethinking then. So, you know, I, I think, the, yes, uh, as Chris says, China might be having a rethink, but also I think Europeans, the European Union uh, uh, are really uh, reconsidering, just as America has been, uh, the closeness of that economic relationship with China. All right, well, we are out of time but we are not out of questions. So I apologize to all the folks who sent really amazing questions in and did not get them answered. Um, we just had two great brains to pick today and we couldn't get to everything. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you, oh, Chris. Thank you, 
Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Fiona. It's great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. We'll just have to do it again and bring some colleagues. <laughs> we would, <laughs> some, that, China, some China specialists. <laughs> we would love that. And I just want to thank everyone for being here. I wanted to let you know our next um, virtual program is April 7th at noon. It is a conversation with Aki Peretz. He is the author of Disruption, Inside the Largest Counterterrorism Investigation in History. That should be very interesting. Please join us. And as always, if you feel like supporting the Spy Museum, we don't mind if you do. And you can do that on our webpage or in the lovely thank you that you're going to get soon. Everyone, stay warm, stay well, and um, Let's hope things all look more optimistic soon. Thanks, Amanda. Bye now.